If we look at it in this way, we can say, okay, let's take the macrophage and break it up. And then we'll just measure the amount of metal in it. This is zinc in nanogram per milliliter. We're going to measure the amount of metal in this macrophage after we've broken it, broken it up. And we're also going to do the same experiment for the histoplasma, measure the zinc of that recovered from the cells. Uh, well, look what happens. In this case, as we activate the bone marrow macrophage, uh, the amount of zinc in the white blood cell activated increases. That's kind of what we'd like, because it needs the zinc. But in the HC, what happens? Look here for zinc, and I have other metals too. It goes way down, with the activated relative to just the culture, and it's just growing happily. So when we give it an infection, in a lot of ways, we can prove that the zinc and the activated cell is going to bring that zinc down, and that is going to be bad news for this, uh, the culture, and I show that, or the, the uh, uh, infection. So let's look at this one. Supposing we get those nice little expensive mice and, and buy the ones that uh, knock out the MT1 and MT2 gene. That's all. They run around scrambling. I'm not sure they know they don't have an MT1 or MT2 gene. Uh, and they probably don't care. Uh, but we're going to knock it out because one of the questions people would ask, well, really, are the metallothionines really that important? It would seem so to this point, but you can see what happens. WT stands for wild type. That's just the standard mouse that is used. It's activated macrophage and diseased. This one is not activated and not diseased. And you see our peak at 20 is, uh, can't really be talked about because it's not there. Uh, <coughs> we see with the knockout mice, same, now this experiment right here with this peak. Now with the mouse that has the metallothionine uh, missing, nothing. So clearly metallothionine becomes necessary. Supposing we have uh, no metallothionine one and two. Let's see what happens here. This now is the growth, the growth of that disease, the growth of that fungus. HCCFU was a sign I had, but I changed that. Its colony, colony forming unit is the way the biologists like to look at it. Here is the non-activated plus disease, activated plus disease. You can see what happened. In the wild type mouse, zinc goes down. The mouse without methionine, Zinc just stays nicely upward, so you could almost make a statistical argument that it overlaps. Actually, we have to do all these experiments at least three times. So what I'm showing you are not averages, but I'm showing you a, a typical appearance. They might change slightly from time to time, but to get it published, the clinical people want it published in nature. And that makes life tougher, because nature wants the whole metabolic scheme explained. They like the article, but they ask for, well, don't you do this other little experiment? And I'll try to show you one at the end. Well, here we are where we were last time. What did we learn from the experiments? What happens to the zinc? Ah, ah. You don't need to pay attention to this one. I actually meant to eliminate it. But cell Imaging and imaging individual parts of the cell is very popular in this business. Not with the chemists, but with the others. Blue is the nucleus. Okay, that's, we're looking inside a cell. Blue is the nucleus. Green is the zinc. Now, the thing one looks for in these kind of things is, we, of course, had to analyze for zinc, but... And we know it lights up right here, it lights up right here, and you see 
zinc lighting up right here next to this nucleus. And this is a red dye that actually lights up the macrophage. And I think you get some distortion here. But look at with the GMCFF. Look at the, the character of this versus this. Much more diffuse. Also, look with this cytokine where the zinc is. It's all over the place. Again, another look, a different look, at the same thing we were seeing by ICPMS, that uh, this stuff does not appear to work in terms of activating that uh, business. Well, let's look at this one. Here's the zinc. Here's the nucleus. And here's the Golgi. If you remember looking at my, my cell model, the Golgi were sitting right next to the nucleus. And so we have all these dyes, so I, I'm, I, I'm glad they don't ask me to interpret these things because they mix them all up. They, you know, when, you, when you take and merge everything, you get somewhat interestingly, it almost mimics the shape. This one, this one, this one, with that one, that one, and that one. And we have nuclei. We have Golgi, and it looks like if we, if we understand uh, what colors might form if green gets mixed with the, the red and the, the blue, that lo and behold, maybe zinc is being transported to the Golgi for storage, for storage in the macrophage cell that it might be able to take out as it needs it but it doesn't get to the little nice compartment where the disease is. So, and I'll ask the question here and hopefully I'll have enough time to uh, talk about this for a few minutes. But as a chemist, having taken a lot of inorganic chemistry in graduate school, which at that point in time was a lot of emphasis on chelating chemistry, uh, the question got asked in some of our joint meetings, why do you know this dye is specific for zinc? Doesn't it, what if it lights up something else? Furthermore, how do you know it's selective? By selective, I mean, how do you know it lights up just for the exchangeable, labile, or free zinc, whatever you want to call it? What if it lights up for a zinc protein or lights up for zinc trapped in a membrane or whatever? So we've done some of those experiments. I don't know if I'm going to get to them, but off we go. Zinc transporting to the Golgi, but they're hanging around within the cytoplasm and nothing's happening. What happens then? Let's take a look. Here's our friend, the zinc exporters. Will they export zinc from the cellular fluid into the Golgi? Well, that's what we think is happening. That's what the confocal microscopy shows, another analytical technique. Uh, we that do mass spectroscopy and trace metal analysis don't typically do this, but the other folks do it and find this is extremely uh, useful. Now we're starting to ask, uh, is there anything else? We know it's zinc deprived, we know it's lysed, uh, the disease. Now, is there anything else that might kill it, like forming reactive oxygen species? Uh, and actually, that turns out to have an effect as well. <laughs> Zinc chelation leads to more reactive oxygen species because it uh, allows uh, NADPH uh, that produces these guys to be more effective. So, let's just look at what happens to free zinc. Just look at the experiment here. You don't have to worry about this pre-experiment. Here's the bone marrow macrophage with the infection. Here is the changes in the reactive oxygen species. Now, supposedly you adjust the experiment to adjust low zinc. Ah, reactive oxygen comes up. And so it would appear if we now try to take away most of the zinc with the T-pen, then we get even a more increase in the reactive oxygen species. So it doesn't look like 
Zinc is just depriving the infection of food. It looks like its effect is to actually generate species that are going to be toxic to that disease. And uh, so we go on one more. And we see our reactive oxygen species. I put that in there. We're now taking zinc away from this. We're putting zinc into here for storage. We've got zinc chelated all around the cell. HC inhibits the growth, deprives zinc within there, and intoxicates it with ROS. So that poor little disease is really getting hit hard. Uh, and so supposedly that would be the elimination of all of this. This is as far, well, we got further with this. I didn't know how to put it into the model. So I'll just show you of some things of the last couple of weeks. This is actually a question asked by a reviewer. And the question was simple. What happens if we silence, that is, we don't form the zips, as this, the model earlier shows, uh, as one of the proteins expressed and formed. Supposing we silence that possible formation. Referee question. We thought we had enough. I, the analytical chemist, honestly think we have three papers. We have more than 100 good figures. And the more experiments you do means the less you can put in your paper because these nature type journals have a, like a 5,000 word limit. And so you can put it in the supplement, but you find there's all this good stuff in the supplement and whatnot, so it drives me crazy. But that's the way they want to do it. And so they can do it that way. If I were calling all the shots on this on the second paper, I get to call the shots. We'll make it two or three rather than uh, <coughs> one nature paper. What is important to you as students is not so much anymore how highly regarded is the journal, but it is how well can people access that journal. And, and for example, we would never publish any, in any journal that wasn't uh, abstracted by Medline or Toxline because the people that need to see it could easily see it and find it. That is what will drive your own personal impact factors, which many countries, and I think Brazil as well, count very much for promotion. I don't mean impact factors, but number of citations. So I regard that as more important than what you get from the papers you published, and people can access, as you know, papers anywhere, everywhere, any journal, at any time. So that's my spiel on that. So we did some experiments. This is the zip with the silencing RNA. Look, our, I don't even have on this one the peak, so let me go down to the next one and you'll find these are our 20s. This is our silencing RNA. But of course, these guys want to control. So, <laughs> uh, things I learn as I go on. You can buy scrambled silencing RNA, which does not fit any of the mRNA, so it serves as a control. The scramble simply means change these words to control. You see what happens, look the same as what happens I've been showing you. The zip silenced RNA, you can see the decrease in here. No zinc transport, no. What's the reason to form metallothionine? There is none, so you don't see it. That one means there's less zinc uh, but the, so n not much metallothionine is produced. And this over here says kind of interestingly that there's less metallothionines, but there's still zinc deprivation to the disease. You can see this thing kind of flat. You see it kind of flat over here, the infected one, meaning there's very little free zinc, which would be at this right side of the chromatogram. And you can even do zinc content, 1400 uh, in terms of nanogram per gram would be the uh, average amount we would see uh, in the uh, disease by just taking it wild type, growing it. And then if we 
do these different experiments with the scrambler, with the one that actually uh, cuts out the zip uh, protein, the zinc goes down, the effect is still the same to answer that reviewer's question. This is what we will submit. Here we've got it. We'll probably have to put it in a paper even though we don't have room. And there were a couple other questions, but this one I, I just got a hold of in the last, well, this morning. <laughs> so I put a couple things in. <clears throat> 